We'll post the link to the YouTube presentation there if you want to uh, revisit this presentation. I'll put the slides up and then the YouTube video presentation will simply be a video of me and, and uh, this presentation. So without further ado, let's uh, get her started. All right, this is the agenda. We're going to go through the, adju the adjudication overview uh, and then talk about the proposed determination process, ex explain exactly what it is that we're doing and maybe uh, give you some context of why we do this. We'll talk about some, some of the anticipated issues and, and the timeline that we expect throughout the process. And then I'll answer questions, but I'll probably be brief on the questions um, unless they're broad-based. And, and we'll just kind of go over there and uh, from there. And then we'll have my team and my staff. And maybe I'll bring them up and you can come and ask them questions. We do have some large-scale aerial imagery maps out uh, in the back there to kind of help us figure out where you're at and if, if you have any specific questions of that. But we can kind of go over that. Uh, first and foremost, we are here to help you through this process. You, I know it feels, probably feels intimidating, maybe a little overwhelming. You're not sure what this is, especially in the state of Utah sends you a summons. I understand it, but uh, I guarantee you or I assure you that we will walk you through this process as, as to the best of our ability. Okay, so what is a water right? <clears throat> in the state of Utah, a water right is the uh, kind of the right to divert from, the, from a natural source and, and beneficially use the water. Uh, it typically has a, a few different elements associated with it. Um, a defined nature of beneficial use, that would be like irrigation or stock watering or municipal or domestic. A priority date, that's generally when the water was first appropriated. Um, generally, in this area, a lot of the water rights are wells and were appropriated in the early uh, 1900s, uh, you know, anywhere from 1900 uh, to the late 60s or so. A defined quantity of water allowed for the diversion, uh, generally we call that a flow rate. And you'll see the, uh, the acronym CFS, that means cubic feet per second. Or it's either by that flow rate or by what we call a volume, an, an annual volume, an acre foot. So if you can imagine an acre of property, one foot deep, that represents uh, an acre foot. And then a, a point of diversion. And for most of the water rights in the area that we're talking about, that point of, those points of diversion are wells. So that's going to be the most frequent thing we're, we'll be talking about. Um, and a specific place of use, uh, in, in essence, where is it being put to use? So you may, you know, water rights are generally evidenced by a few things. Um, wells located on your property, you have some examples of some wells there, some well heads, some, some small domestic wells. Or, you know, irrigation ditches or head gates, that central picture is kind of like a old fashioned or a head gate. I don't expect too many of these within the area, at least none of the water rights we have on record come from surface sources there may be a drain or two um, but for the most part they are all wells I think they're 99.8 percent of them are are wells okay what a water right is not a water right is not a share in an irrigation company an irrigation company owns the water rights and then they, they issue shares to use that water so if you have shares those don't rep really represent a water right by themselves the irrigation company would be responsible for pursuing this adjudication, for responding to us since they are the owner of those rights. And it's not a connection to a public water supplier, um, like um, you might, yeah, Salt Lake Public Water Utilities. If you, if you, know, if you are connected to the, the local water supplier, that's not a water right. We're not going to take it away. It has nothing to do with it. The water supplier, the, the public utility, would be responsible for responding to this action. So if, you, if you're connected and you have your water meter out front, um, that's not what we're talking about here when we talk about water rights. So you don't need to be worried about us coming in and switching off your water. Um, you, you can talk to Salt Lake Public Utilities or whoever your water provider is about uh, that issue if you forget to pay your bill or something. All right, so what I generally like to do is talk about the historical context of why we do a general adjudication just because there, it helps to answer a lot of the questions behind why we're doing this and, and really what prompts the need for this. So. I, I usually start off back in 1847, you know, when the pioneers first entered the valley and, and uh, they started diverting the water from City Creek to soften up some of the land so that they could uh, plow crops on it. And, you know, so Brigham Young comes in, he, he, he says this is the place, and then they, you know, years later they build a shopping mall on top of that same place. So um, that's just a little historical note. 
1848, Brigham Young said that they you know, kind of made this prophetic somewhat to have a degree that there shouldn't be any private ownership of water rights, that they belong to the people. And in Utah, that's still the rule, that water rights are, are owned by the public. It's the property of the, the citizens of Utah. It's not owned by the state. The state administers them, but it's owned by the public. So that still remains true to today. Well, between 1847 and 1850, the, what we now know as Utah went through several configurations. You know, it was first a, a territory of Mexico, and then it went to the state of this kind of semi-ecclesiastical state of Deseret, and then to the territory of Utah. So you can imagine as, as it kind of morphed through those phases, that water was, continue, was put to use ever since they got into the valley and started diverting it, right? And so water had been being put to use before, long before what we now know as Utah was part of the United States. And so you can imagine that these water uses took many forms, and some of them were on the record, some of them were not. And so they were they, essentially formed on a community basis. Brigham Young would send off a, uh, someone to the northern parts of Utah or southern parts of Utah and have them develop a community, and they'd start diverting the waters there and planting their crops. And so they're kind of... Um, these water uh, rights, so to speak, or the, the use of water, formed out, out of a communal need to use the water rights in, the, in that type of setting. Um, the doctrine of priority actually evolved from the, the church leaders. They kind of recognized a first class of a water right or a priority right. So people who were there first, they got all the flow of the, of the, the river, and so they got the primary right. And then people who came on later, they could have whatever wasn't considered the normal flow, and that would be a secondary right. And this is actually interesting that this caught on throughout the West. So in other states, uh, later adopted this. And it's kind of interesting that Utah is one of the first states to actually practice the concept of irrigation and, and was quite a leader for a long time in that uh, field. And as a result of it kind of being a church-centered um, government, a lot of the conflicts were settled through ecclesiastical channels. Uh, you had bishops, courts for kind of wo local disputes, and then they had the state high councils that serve as kind of the appellate uh, courts. They could appeal to them and if they didn't like what the bishop had to say. Um, and then as we go into the, his the, the territorial era, the, there was a, a territorial legislative assembly that attempted to kind of break away from the religious uh, aspect of it. And so they, they made a, the county or the, the respective ca county court responsible for the issuing of these water rights and, and allowing people to divert. Up to that point, it pretty much if the, the bishop said you could, you're good to go, and the bishop would kind of act as water master and ditch rider and everything else like that. Well, they kind of, with the territorial uh, ter establishment of the territory, they, they tried to peel away from that and, and went to the county court. Unfortunately, th this was only really uh, followed in, the in Salt Lake County and wasn't really followed, adhered to the rest of the state. In 1877, the Desert Land Act uh, was uh, passed through Congress, and it delegated the authority to uh, the respective state to, to um, manage the affairs of water. So you can imagine, all of a sudden, Utah is now a ter territory part of the United States. The practical way in which, you, in which you acquire land is through the patent office. Well, you know, they kind of thought, well, that might be the same case with water rights. Well, this Desert Land Act was passed in order to kind of... Uh, incentivize the settlement of these western states and so in doing so they they severed that responsibility from the United States to issue patents on water and gave it to the territory or respective state. Um, due to a failure to enforce uh, the previous act, the legislature passed another act that kind of gave the county selectmen the authority to to decree water rights and settle issues uh, but not really appropriate. They still had to go and hammer in their stake, you know, kind of like old-fashioned mining times where they go stake their claim on the source and, and then they'd go record it the county. So confusion continued to, in spite of the efforts of the Utah Territorial Legislature, uh, the church continued to administer and decree water rights. We have an example that I often cite is the High Council decision in 1879 that governed the, the distri distribution of the Spanish Fork River. And, and today, that, a lot of that is still upheld and, and followed to this day. Um, so as Utah came into this, became a state in 1896, there was only there was some, some concerns that there was a movement about to confiscate all the water and give the state the power to kind of say, yeah, the state owns all the, power, all the water. And so they were really reluctant to shape any type of water law at that time. The only thing they did put in there in, in the uh, Constitution of the state of Utah was they recognized all existing rights. And they said any existing 
All existing rights to the use of any of the waters in the state for any unusual beneficial purposes are hereby recognized and confirmed, meaning, hey, if you've been using water and you've been diverting it, you're good to go. You can continue to do so. So that pretty much ushered in the concept that if you've been putting it into beneficial use, you don't need to worry about the, the, what would come down the road, the appropriation laws of appropriating these water rights. In 1897, the state Office of State Engineer, what is now today the Division of Water Rights, was formed in order to uh, kind of conduct hydrographic surveys. We'll talk about the modern day equivalent of that today. However, to appropriate water, you still had to go stake your claim. You still had to post notice at the, at the post office and the county recorder. So it was still largely ignored and, and hard to find a centralized place where all these existing water rights um, were of record. And then in 1902, the, the Utah United States Reclamation Service was formed with the kind of the mission to reclaim the West. We know them as the Bureau of Reclamation today. But they were really reluctant to build any type of water project in any of the states until there was a comprehensive uh, water law in place in order to make sure that any rights that they were going to that they were going to appropriate weren't infringed upon by people who had already been diverting. So, um, in 1902, they were formed. So it's no uh, consequence, no you know coincidence. That in 1903, Utah came up with its first comprehensive water law because they were anxious to capitalize on some of these large um, projects. And so, as part of that water law. Uh, the recording of all existing water rights and the adjudication of all rights was brought into existence. However, the legislature in typical fashion failed to provide funding for actually doing it, so it kind of languished for quite a while um, until 1919, which the legislature said, all right, we're going to let the state engineer go in and, and figure out what the water rights, kind of do an audit in this area, see what water rights are of record, who's, who's um, diverting, who, what, uh, uh, where these are at, their flow rates, their uses, etc. And that was only for surface water. And then in 1935, they said, well, surface water and groundwater, that's all connected. It's all the same water. So we're going to bring groundwater underneath the same law. So prior to the enactment of, the, of that 1903 water law, water rights were essentially uh, could fall into a combination of five categories. They were decreed by ecclesiastical leaders. Uh, they were filed for a record of the county. Uh, sometimes you could have rights decreed by the court. Uh, and that, that would only involve a limit, limited number of parties. Uh, sometimes you'd have contractual agreements among parties. And then you had those that were just never manifested. They just continued, hey, I'm good to go. I had this right prior to 1903. I, there's no need for me to really record it. So they continued to beneficially use it. And the adjudication was meant to find those rights, bring them onto the record, so we really knew what rights were being used. So as a, as a result of that, uh, there was no public record. There was over-appropriation was rampant. Uh, rights weren't defined until controversy, and they had to be settled by either ecclesiastical channels or court decree. And uh, in 1901 and 1902, the state engineer made this comment with respect to the need for adjudication. He says, the definition of existing rights appears to be of first importance. This is not only necessarily to pacify present contention, but to prevent future conflicts and encourage further progress. There can be no safe basis for future work before existing rights are known and made pu of public record. So they needed to figure out who was diverting water, who was put into beneficial use, because there was no centralized location for these records. Which brings us to the concept of a general adjudication. And what is a, a general adjudication? You can see that map. These are the areas that um, are all under, you, you can see there's not a square inch of Utah that isn't covered by a general adjudication that has either been in, uh, implemented or, or completed. Right now, we're in the Utah Lake Jordan River general adjudication. You see that date, 1944. That means this thing that we're doing now has been going on since 1944. It actually started in 1939 and, uh, as, a, as a result of a court case and was transferred into what we're doing today in 1944. So what is it? It's an action. It's a legal action in, in the state district court, which is, which is why you received summons in that packet. It brings you in as parties to this legal action. It's a comprehensive legal action, so everyone within that area is effectively joined to the action. Um, as I mentioned, it binds water users and the state engineer, uh, the Division of Water Rights. So in essence, everyone's joined, everyone's a party, so all water rights are settled with respect to everybody else, rather than these limited actions among uh, uh, limited parties. That's the title and section and title chapter of Utah Code it's governed by. And the, the first general stream adjudications took place in the 20s. You have the Severe, the Weaver River, and the Virgin River basins. So why do we conduct them? 
Well, first of all, we want to bring all claims on the permanent record. You remember those claims that were just in prior to 1903, the people that were diverting water and never had a reason to bring them forward? Well, we want to bring them onto the record. We want to make sure we know what's where so that we can plan for the future, um, the, for the water needs of the future. Uh, so diligence claims are typically what we refer to uh, rights that were diverted prior to 1903 on surface sources. And as I mentioned, in 1935, they said, all right, we're also going to bring underground wells and, and whatnot, other sources, into the same, under the same law. So in essence, you could be, have diverted from a well prior to 1935 and not needed a right. After 1935, you needed to file for a water right. So part of this would be to go through, identify some of those wells that were already uh, diverted prior to 1935, which just never made it onto the records of the state engineer. And there's these things called uh, Federal Reserve water rights. There aren't any in this area. They're water rights that uh, they're an implied water right that have to do with federal reservations, such as Indian reservations or Forest Service or national parks, those types of things. I'm not going to get too much into that. I don't want to bore you with the details. If you want to talk to me about it afterwards, feel free to come up and we can talk Federal Reserve water rights. It's an interesting topic. Um, another reason is to prevent multiplicity of suits so that people aren't suing each other. We just want to bring everyone in in one suit, get everything settled, get in, get out, get it done with. Uh, we remove and reduce rights which have been wholly or partially forfeited through non-use. The law in the books on most western states is use it or lose it uh, with regard to water rights. And that's to help promote the most beneficial use of water. They want to make sure if there is a right to use it, the people are going to use it. Otherwise, it needs to be, it needs to revert back to the public for future appropriations or to satisfy the needs of pre-existing rights. And so part of the adjudication process is to identify those rights which have been abandoned which have fallen out of non-use for the, the time period of seven years. So if it hasn't been used within seven years, it could be, uh, it could be proposed to the court that it be uh, disallowed or forfeited. The court is the one that would actually do the forfeiture. And then uh, we want to obtain a final comprehensive decree on all the water rights. This just kind of helps solidify it, uh, especially those rights which weren't, uh, didn't go through the normal appropriations process. Here's the process in, in kind of my best infographic. Um, you can see steps one, two, and three, and four is the step we're on tonight, the public meeting. Steps one, two, and three you, uh, have been completed. Um, following this public meeting, the next step will be to conduct a hydrographic survey and then send out, well, we've actually already conducted the hydrographic survey, so it's kind of out of sequence. We can do it at any time, but I needed to put it somewhere, so I put it in step number five. Hydrographic survey has been completed. And the next step will be in early February when we send out notice to everyone who received notice tonight, unless they've asked to be removed from the list, that it's time to submit claims. And they'll have 90 days to submit a claim. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. We take those claims. We do an evaluation. We look at them, see which ones are valid, see which ones, you know, it's not unheard of. We get people claiming all kinds of crazy stuff. So we go out and we check them, make sure they actually do have a well, make sure they do have whatever number of stock they're, they're claiming or domestic use. And we put them in a proposed determination. We have another public meeting to discuss a proposed determination, after which there are 90 days to object. Uh, we do a final summons, and then we resolve some of the objections there might be. And I'm going to go into these in a lot more detail, so excuse the thumbnail summary there. But let's go ahead and, and talk about filing your water user's claim, which is going to be the next step for you guys. So as I mentioned earlier, probably around we're going to shoot for February 1st is when we're going to start mailing out. But if you don't get on February 1st, don't call up alarm. We're going to, beginning of February, we're going to send out notice to submit a water user claim. And so we will send out notice to uh, all people who are owners of record on our rights, but on our, excuse me, on our records, but also to the property owners. So it'd be the same list that we used to generate this same notice. So if you receive notice to come to this meeting, you'll receive notice to submit a claim. And in, in essence, we went to the county recorder's office. We found all the property owners within that area within the Nibley Park area and got their their uh, mailing addresses from that and that's what we use to send out notice if you're wondering how we got your address or your name. With that notice we will send out if you are a water right owner of record meaning we have your name and your information and your ownership your water right information we'll send you out a claim which pretty much represents what we have on our database. It'll, it'll say when the priority date, it'll say how much it's for, what it can be used for, where it's to be used at. It'll have all the information filled in. All you need to do is 
review over it, and if you want to make some edits, you can do that. Sign it, have it notarized, and mail it back in, or bring it in back in to us, and we'll process it. Um, if, we, if you are a property owner, you'll receive a blank water user's claim, just in case you have a well that we just don't know of. Or if you have a water right that we don't know of, that we don't have on our records, or if there's just some confusion. That way you can fill it out to your best of your ability. We recommend that you come in, you schedule an appointment with someone from my team, and we can help you fill that out. Um, and then it will need to be signed and notarized and that good stuff. It, we understand that this is not something you, everyone does on a daily basis, and it can be complicated, and especially um, when you start talking about the public land survey system and tying in points of diversion. to. Once we send that notice out, that triggers the 90 days. You'll have 90 days to return that claim, to file your claim. You can either file it with the state engineer, with us, the Division of Water Rights, we're just right upstairs, or you can file it with the court. Um, but you only have 90 days to do it. If you don't file it within 90 days, you risk forfeiting uh, your right to assert a water right. So we encourage you. It doesn't take much time. I know it can be burdensome if you're trying to figure it out yourself. Come on in or call us. We'll walk you through it on the phone. However you need to be helped, we can help out. Um, that's what we're here for. Once we receive the claims, at the end of that 90 days, we will um, go out and do a field investigation to verify the claim, to verify the location of the well, verify the beneficial uses of it. Um, if, you claim, if you're claiming that you're using it to, for your, your house or domestic use, what we say, we're going to verify that you actually have the, the, the plumbing in to do that. You can't just say, well, the well's out there and I can hook it up to my house. It's, you know, we need to actually see that you're, you're doing that. Um, now, if you have a well out there and you have a ho hose and you say, I can use it for irrigation, we, you know, that's easy. That's easy. But, you know, trying to demonstrate that you're using it for your domestic uses when we can clearly see the water meter from Jordan Valley Water Conservancy District in your front yard, it's a little bit of a stretch for us to ignore that. So be cognizant of that as you file these claims. These are your official pleadings with the court. So there is the ability to perjure yourself. I would um, suggest you not do that. But it's your claim. Once we go out and do the field evaluation, we will compile all those claims. We'll, we'll go and we'll submit our what we call the proposed determination of water rights. You know, let's kind of skip over that. We'll, we'll compile the claims into a proposed determination and we will file that with the court. We also will send notice to everyone else that it's been filed, that it's been published, and we'll give you access to where you can find a copy of it. Um, generally online, you can download a PDF, but if you want to come in and, and flip through a manual copy, you can do that too, or you can purchase a manual copy as well. Um, in essence, that represents what the state engineer is recommending to the district court, represent the water rights. So if you file a claim, we go out there, when everything checks out, we're going to put that in the proposed determination and, and submit it to the court. Now, if you file a claim and we go out there and it's just ridiculous and you say, you know, it's, it's a well, but it's really, it's under my driveway. I have no access to it, but I use it. I totally use it. And it's going to be a little bit of a stretch for us to, to make that recommendation to the court in good faith. Um, I, I understand we, we really get no pleasure out of recommending rights to be forfeited or disallowed. I, I promise you that we, uh, we try to do what we can to make sure that you walk through this process. So if you do have a valid water right, it gets recognized. But just don't, don't make ridiculous claims and then expect us to, um, I guess, turn a blind eye. Uh, you know, it's, that wouldn't be ethical of us as much as we want. We'd like to help you out. And so that proposed determination will be published. You'll receive notice and we'll hold a public meeting. And then once you receive notice of that proposed determination, you have 90 days to file an objection. Now, these objections you can't file with the state engineer. You actually have to file these with the district court. In essence, that's if you disagree with what we've put in the proposed determination, you must file that with the district court within that 90-day time period. Um, sometimes you can petition the court to allow these objections before we can get the court to issue a decree on the proposed determination. So by filing an objection, you've essentially put the foot in the door, the proverbial foot in the door, and said, hold on, before we get a decree, I want to have my day in court. And so what will generally happen is we'll, we'll review the objection and we'll meet with the water user and just try to figure out what's going on. And, you know, we're not interested in, in representing something, we don't, we're not interested in representing something that's wrong. So if we made a mistake, we're happy to correct it and we'll petition the court to correct it. Um, so generally these, these objections get 
with are uh, resolved in three ways. You have voluntary withdrawal. Maybe they just didn't understand, and they said, "All right, my bad. I'll I'll withdraw my objection." Um, most likely, it's settlement. We try to figure out what's going on. Um, if we made an error, a clerical error, or something, we correct it, and then they'll they'll withdraw the objection. If not, then we'll go ahead and litigate it in the district court, and the court takes the, the questions of fact and law and compares it to the proposed determination and makes a, a decision as to whether the pro proposed determination should stand or not. And, and obviously, just like in any other court uh, proceeding, you have the option to appeal. Um, and then the, once the objections are resolved, we petition the court to uh, have a decree issued on the proposed determination. Now back in the early days, you'll remember they had these big, large swaths of land that they do just one proposed determination. Well, as Utah has grown and, and there have been more water users and more water rights, we've kind of gotten smaller and smaller and smaller sections until we're where we're at now, where we're doing these small, you know, multi-block sections which have maybe 700 claims in them in a in a tight, you know, uh, square mile configuration. So what that means is we we're trying to get a decree on the whole drainage. So but we have to get little small inter what we call interlocutory decrees on these small pieces of the drainage, one at a time, and then, you know, after we do this for a million years, we'll eventually get the drainage, I guess. Um, um, we're, but we're trying to expedite this process, and we're making some good progress. Um, we just want to make sure we, we get it right. Federal Reserve water rights, again, come talk to me about it. You have an interest in de delving into the history of Supreme Court decisions. Um, and we typically petition the court to issue a decree that will close the basin to, to filing of diligence claims. If you're familiar with what the diligence claim is, it's essentially saying, my great great granddaddy diverted water prior to 1903 in case of surface water, 1935 in case of groundwater, I have a right to use it. What they'll say is, hey, you've had your chance to come forward, this basin's closed, you can't make any of those claims at this time anymore. Okay, let's talk about the specific Nibley Park adjudication. This is the boundary. It's the same boundary on the notice you received. Those yellow dots represent the wells or points of diversion. Uh, at least the general locations, they're the same points that are plotted on these maps back here. They are not 100% accurate. They're not, uh, a lot of these were filed for during um, World War II times and, and, or in the 50s, and, and the Utah legislature made it a, a point not to require an engineer to certify these or to require proof because there just was a dearth of eligible engineers because they're all fighting the war, right? And so many of these points of derision may be very inaccurate. So I wouldn't take these as the gospel truth. That's part of what we do as the adjudication process is verify these and see which ones are accurate and which ones need to be corrected. Um, total number of water rights on record, uh, 700 and change. Like I said, nearly all underground wells, and if you're a water nerd, that's 8,000 acre feet diverted out of that, or authorized to be diverted out of that. Here's the, the anticipated timeline. I've already kind of talked about the location of these no proof required water rights. We're still, we, you know, that's going to be something we're used to working through. We've got some methods to kind of sleuth that out. Um, so if you have a question, come ask us, and we'll help, we'll help uh, kind of figure that out. Um, but we also have a lot of water rights that have, as title has changed between landowners. You know, they've changed their title at the county recorder, which is the office of record. However, they haven't updated the state engineer with the ownership of the water right. So that's, you know, they haven't updated title to us. And so our records on our water rights may not reflect who actually owns the existing water right. And there's a process to get that updated. Um, we encourage you to do that. We can point you in the right direction of how to do that and, and kind of help you through that process. It's not necessary to do within that 90-day time frame. We encourage you to just file a claim and just line out the person's name who might be on your, your water right and put your name in it in its stead. We'll, we'll worry about title update. Just get the claim in within that 90-day time frame. As I mentioned, February, we're going to send out uh, water users' claims. You know, have 90 days. That 90-day period will begin ticking. In April, that 90-day period will expire, and we'll start begin. We'll begin to investigate the filed claims. Around June, we expect, you know, depending on how um, intense these investigations have to be, we anticipate publishing the proposed determination. Again, you'll receive notice. We'll do another public meeting, answer any questions you have, and then that 90-day 
uh, objection period begins. So if you go 90 days from June, you end up in September. And if everything just worked out like it was supposed to in the, in the perfect world, we would petition the court to uh, enter a, a, a decree at that period. But in any case, that 90-day window would terminate in September. So uh, the biggest question maybe on some, of, on some people's mind is probably, do I have a water right in the first place? That's probably the biggest question. But the second biggest question might be, will I lose my water right? Um, so if you're using your water right in conformance with what we have on our records, you have nothing to worry about. Just file a claim. You know, if I can repeat something enough times tonight, it's file the claim. Even if you can't think of the exact way it's used or how it's being, um, where it's diverted from or whatever, file the claim. We'll figure it out later. Just get it in within that 90-day time frame. Uh, individuals using water without a water right record are required to submit a claim during this process or they essentially are risk they'll be barred from ever asserting that. It's that diligence claim I was talking about that you know, the court's going to say, hey, we can't accept any more of this. You've had your chance to come forward. Um, and again, the non-use issue, if, you've, if your water right has fallen out of use for a period of seven years or more, um, it could potentially be recommended to be disallowed to the court, and then the court would forfeit it unless, it, unless you filed an objection and, and were able to litigate it successfully, demonstrating that, in fact, it had not been forfeited through non-use. All right, who can I contact? That's me. I'm Blake Bingham. Josh Zimmerman, standing back here in the back, the green shirt and tie, wave your hand. Josh is the team leader uh, who will be uh, kind of managing the boots on the ground for this particular adjudication. That's his contact information. For the most part, he's going to be your best point of contact. This information is also on that handout. Um, feel free to call me. Feel free to call Josh. Email us. Walk in however you want to do. Or if you just can Google Division of Water Rights, um, public inquiry have been very helpful in, in fielding a lot of these questions and helping people through the water user claim process as well. Okay, at this time I'm, I'm willing to answer some broad-based questions. Um, if they're kind of specific to your parcel or your water right, maybe we can conclude and we can answer those offline. I got a whole bunch of people here that help us. Actually, while I do, before we do that, while I have the staff the, of like a public inquiry and my staff come up here so they know who can come in, can you guys, Clark, can you have your staff come forward? Chris, Josh, Nick, come up just so you know who you can come talk to at the conclusion of this meeting. If you, if you're done, you've seen enough, feel free to, to make your way out and boogie on home. That's cool, too. We've all seen enough, right? OK, so these guys standing up right here, these are going to be able to answer your, one -on your individual questions if you have them. Some of them might be able to stick around for the most part. But, so I'll go ahead and answer whatever broad-based questions we have. Yes, ma'am. The question was, will the homeowners of the respective well be notified of the field investigation? The answer is, if you give us your phone number, we would love to call you and make that appointment to do that. Otherwise, if we can't, we'll probably just go out and try to view it on our own. Fair enough. Yeah, so the, the follow-on to her question was that they, they had built some structures over the well, maybe a well house, or maybe it's, and I've even seen some wells in a garage and stuff like that. And so we really we try our best to contact the water user. If we, can, if we have contact information, um, we will make that every effort. Otherwise, I would, I would hope that you would explain some of this on your claim just so that we, if, in case we, cross, we don't cross paths, we can take that into consideration. But you always have, you have an opportunity to come in and explain that to us as well. Sir? How do you give When we send you, so the question was, how do we get, give me your phone numbers? When you receive notice in early February, you'll have the opportunity to file a claim. I would recommend writing the phone number on the claim itself. And we will provide a, a, a space on the blank claim to do that. The other claims, I don't think there's an actual field or place to put the telephone. Just pencil it in somewhere. That'd be helpful. One follow-up question. The question was, do we own these water rights? The answer is, it's complicated. Yes, you own, you could be the owner of the water right. You, you are the owner of the right to use the water. It's kind of a, it's called a usufructory right. It doesn't mean you own the water. It doesn't mean you, you own it 
no questions asked means you have the, the ability to divert it so long as you're putting it to beneficial use. Hold on, this gentleman had this question. Hands up, sir. Yeah, so I've purchased a property with what water rights? Because they're not being used. So. The question was kind of an open ended question. He's purchased property, but they're not being used. In that essence, we would go and we'd see have they been used in the last seven years? And if the, the examination held that they had not been used in seven years, we'd make the recommendation to the court that they be disallowed per Quite Utah sure. law. If we go out there and they're not being used, we're going to make that recommendation. If we go out there and they're being used, there's probably not much reason to look beyond that. So read whatever you want to into that. Sir? As long as we can come in and ver verify that, we, we would need to come in and, and, I, and look and find it. We'd need to go if it's, it, so the question was, it's more of a statement, his well is in his house. Somewhere, right? And I presume that you're able to um, inspect it at some point, right? So you can you can see it. I mean, it's there's something, right? So we would ask that you allow us to come in and just verify its location. And that way, we can correct the point of diversion location and verify that it is, in fact. You can imagine it'd be very easy for people to say, "Oh, it's in my house. Don't worry about it." And then, you know, it'd be kind of difficult for us to verify that. So we'd ask just permission to come in and, and, and verify that. All right. Is there another question over here? Yes, ma'am. She her question was, we're expecting. And I, I'll, I'll sorry. I'll start catering to this side over here. The question was, um, are we're expecting 713 claims? That's how many water rights we have on record. A lot of those have probably been capped, abandoned, paved over, especially with the urbanization. And so there's no need to file a claim if that's the case. So we don't anticipate that we will receive that many claims. All right. Yes, ma'am. If, yes, so the question was, on the notice that will be sent out to us, will it state that we will kind of clearly identify whether we know that the water right exists or not? And so there's two different notices. If we, if we have a water right of record, we will send out the claim associated with that water right to the address listed on the record. But you know, it doesn't really help when some of these records are so old that it has like rural RFD number one, Salt Lake City, and that's the extent of the address. So you can imagine a lot of these get kicked back because the addresses haven't been updated, title hasn't been updated. Otherwise, you'll receive a blank claim. If you're, so a property owners will probably receive two claims if they have an existing water right. They'll receive their, a blank claim with the tax notice, and then they'll receive a water right owner claim as well. You bet. Is it, yes, sir. Yes, the question was, can you explain what beneficial use is? Beneficial use, according to Utah law, a water right is, you know, is, is limited, is, is based on the beneficial use. So beneficial use, an example of it would be irrigation. I'm using water to irrigate this number of acres. Or I'm using water to water this number of cows or chickens or goats or whatever you have. Or I'm using water to satisfy the domestic needs of my house. Does that, make sense? Does that answer your question? So, and so really, that's the basis of a water right. And so without that, the, the flow is a limitation, but it, that's not the water right. The water right is the beneficial use. Was there some more questions? Sir? So is this something that's going to happen every 10 years? The question is, well, is this something that's going to happen every 10 years or repair? Probably not. Most likely, the answer is no right now, unless the Utah legislature gets some type of crazy idea and wants to redo everything. I anticipate that we will not be coming back here again in our lifetime. Hold on, this, this gentleman had his hand up, sir. The question was, assuming that we've, you've received notice to attend this meeting, does that mean you, that their names will be on that claim? The answer is no, because there are a lot of, we sent out notice to property owners who may or may not have a water right. And so in some instances, the name won't be on the claim. In some instances, it will be, unless they've updated the records of the state engineer, their name will not be on the actual claim. They'll have to fill out a blank claim. So 
So the question was, you've, you've, you've purchased a piece of property with a well on it. Does that mean you are the owner of the water right? The answer is probably does, because water rights transfer by appurtenance to the ground unless explicitly withheld from the, from, through the deed. So most likely you are. However, although that title has been recorded at the county recorder, that doesn't mean our records get updated for the, for the purposes of the water right. So most likely you are the owner of the water right, um, barring any kind of exclusionary deeds or whatever. Um, but we may not have our, your, your name on our records. So his question, he wouldn't have to sue his real estate agent. And I would say, seek guidance, counsel from a, 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 an attorney on that. <laughs> oh, are there any other questions? Let me, so I'll come back to you. The question is, the county recorder will show whether a, a well or water right was transferred when the water right was purchased. The answer is probably not, but it may. Um, sometimes they just pretty much sold the, the lot, and sometimes they have blanket statements saying any pertinent water rights. Sometimes they'll say along with this well, or sometimes they'll actually mention the water right. So we get a variety of deeds. So sometimes it does, sometimes it does not. But there's a process to update title for the Division of Water Rights that we can help walk you through. So you don't need to go, well, Come in and ask questions. We'll walk you through that process. Who gets the abandoned rights? The question was, who gets the abandoned rights? The answer is, the basin is hugely over-appropriated. So what happens is, that water, which wasn't being used in the first place, so it's really just paper water we're talking about, really. So you have, you have this much paper water, this much water. So what happens when you remove one of these pieces of paper down here? Probably nothing. The theory is, if you had this much water, this many water rights, and one got removed out, that people would move up in priority and it, it, it'd be used to satisfy the next junior appropriator. In, in honesty, it's over appropriated. What it does, it just goes away and it reduces, I guess, the demand on the aquifer it, when it, with respect to underground claims. Yes, ma'am. I don't know. So the question was, I've noticed that I have one gentleman's name on several water rights on a lot of different properties in and around my property, right? So what, okay, so what usually, you know, these, obviously this area is urbanized or it used to be part of this big block survey, 10 acre tracks, and, and so you had these big landowners who then subsequently subdivided and they probably drilled these wells. So their names are on all these wells, but you know, those water rights never got updated with the current owners of the parcels. So most likely, if you have a well and a water right on your property, it's, you probably are the owner, but it's just not reflected on our database that you are the owner. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, so she said, even though it shows on our site that someone else is an owner, we should still submit a claim. I say emphatically, yes. Yes. Um, we can figure out the ownership issue later, but submit a claim in the meantime. Is there some questions from over this side at all? I know I've been neg neglecting you guys. Yes, ma'am. So the question was, if there's two wells on my property, do I have to file two claims? I'd encourage you to file whatever claims you are using water for that are on your property. So the answer is only if you want to preserve the water right, which I anticipate most people would. And I put it to beneficial use so that when we come out and, be, and, and investigate it, it's easily identified. Yeah, sir. So the question was, the water right is in the name of a previous owner to this parcel to which you now own. How do we go about updating ownership on the state engineer's records? There's a process called the report of conveyance. And in essence, what it does is you, you have a title professional work 
submit this report of conveyance that, that demonstrates chain of title from when, from the owner, so from when the owner, the previous owner, had unity of title with the water right and land and bring it forward to you to show that chain of title and then, then we would update our records. Um, and that's the process, but it's a little bit more involved than that. I can, I can certainly dem I point you in the way of the people who work in title. Yeah, the, yeah, there's a couple different, there's title professionals, there's attorneys that do it, engineers, surveyors, title companies. They can all help you out to file that report of conveyance. Yes, you, you can do your own title search. However, you would still need a title professional in order to submit this, the report of conveyance for us to bring title forward. But you're right, absolutely, we don't want to discourage anyone from doing their own title sleuthing. It would make, probably be cheaper if you take it to the title professional and say, hey, put your stamp on this so I can submit it. Easy money for them and cheaper, probably. I don't know. Are there any other questions? All right, with that, I'm going to dismiss you, everyone. Feel free to stick around, come up, ask personal questions. We have some maps back there. If you want to look at those, ask those personal questions. Thanks again for your attendance. I appreciate it.